Data and the Nature of Measurement, a Relational Summary by T.H. Culhane. If part of our purpose in education is to, quote, bring the subject to life and enliven the text, then we can do little better in our quest to find excitement in data and measurement than this extraordinary quote from The Nature of Measurement, What We Measure and How We Measure by David Byrne, 2002. You can access it by clicking on the link in the syllabus. The author writes, quote, if autobiographies are stories about people, then perhaps statistical models are best understood as stories about variables. Taking this analogy a step further, while autobiography may be understood as textual means of establishing identities for individuals, quantitative analysis might be read as establishing identity for a social group defined by variables such as gender and class. In other words, Although variables are treated as individual attributes during the data collection phase of survey research, analyses and texts will subsequently be produced by the researcher which offer insights about the determining power of those variables as a social and narrative construction." End quote. And then he himself quotes Eliot, 1999, pages 101-102, who writes, quote, "...it is important not to lose sight of the individuals whose lives provide the data for the models." Although variables rather than individual people may become the subjects of the statistician's narrative, it is individuals rather than variables who have the capacity to act and reflect on society." End quote. So there you have it. Far from being dry, lifeless things, statistics are actually distillations of rich and meaningful lives, condensed for better carriage and analysis and parsimonious use. Think of data and the results of measurement and the statistics we use to describe them as a kind of uber-convenient shorthand. Think of them as the result of a magical compression algorithm, a rendering of a room full of stuff into an elixir that can be carried like a message in a bottle or packed into a suitcase, but which, upon arrival at your destination, can be conjured back into full existence, unpacked and demuxed and uncompressed, springing back to life all the richer for having been placed into their new systems thinking context. In a sense, they are like the suitcase of Newt in the film Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. There will be entire worlds in there, but you have to know how to see them. And it isn't really as easy as you might think. Now, I'm not talking just about the training you need to pack and unpack these things in the prosaic way of rendering events in the real world into numbers and then back out into better representations and understandings of the world. That could be done somewhat mechanically. But the way you need to learn to see the world so that you ascribe the proper meaning to what you think you are measuring. We are, says Emmerbeyer in his Manifesto for a Relational Sociology, quoted in Byrne, page 30, quote, faced with a fundamental dilemma, whether to conceive of the social world as consisting primarily in substances or in processes, in static things, or in dynamic unfolding relations, rational actor and norm-based models, diverse holisms and structuralisms, and statistical variable analyses, all of them beholden to the idea that it is entities that come first and relations among them only subsequently hold sway throughout much of the discipline. But increasingly, researchers are searching for viable analytic alternatives, approaches that reverse these basic assumptions and depict social reality instead in dynamic, continuous, and processual terms. That's 1997, page, let me make sure I get this right, page 281. Byrne concludes, quote, so death to the variable, or rather, let us understand clearly once and for all that variables don't exist. They are not real. What exists are complex systems, which systems are nested, intersecting, which involve both the social and the natural, and which are subject to modification on the basis of human action, both individual and social, end quote. It is the kind of statement that you expect would be spawned by systems thinking. And it leads Byrne to ask, quote, so what is it then that we measure when we measure what we used to call variables? My argument is that we measure traces of the systems which make up reality, end quote. He then gets much more specific, which is what we need you to do so that this just doesn't end up some kind of philosophical exercise. He says, quote, to understand what these traces are, we need to think first about the idea of 
phase or state space. And secondly, develop our understanding of the process of classification, end quote, page 32. Now, I expect that for most of us, this feels rather abstract and hence perhaps confusing. To get the most out of it, I found that time invested in creative, nonlinear computer modeling and animation and digital art and music programs really pays off in the way it helps our minds embrace holistic complexities in the non-Euclidean, non-reductionist world of postmodern science. When you start getting comfortable manipulating parameters and state variables using computer game creation software, like Blender 3D and Unity 3D, for example, which I recommend for this course, your mind finds it much easier to relate that visceral, product-oriented work to understanding, quote, data and the nature of measurement, end quote. Byrne tells us, quote, the specification of the state of a complex system is done by identifying values on a range of parameters which do not necessarily include the three dimensions of space, but will always include the specification of the time instant at which the system is in the given state. See, there can be as many parameters as are considered appropriate. We can, by analogy, think of the parameters as separate dimensions and consider the value of any given parameter at a given time point as a coordinate on that dimension at that time. The set of dimensions are considered to describe the state space of the system and the location of the system in terms of its coordinates in the state space is the current state of the system. End quote, page 33. In a program like Unity 3D, which video game producers use to make these complex worlds, you have many, many windows to work in. Only one contains the three dimensions of space, that that is where you build your physical representation of the world, putting in your landscapes and avatars and objects. Another, the animation window, contains the timeline and the markers that describe the, quote, specification of the time instant at which the system is in the given state, end quote. And then there are all the other windows, the scripting window, the materials window, the textures window, the curves window, etc., etc. Each contains a huge number of other parameters whose states you manipulate as you design what you hope will be a compelling game. When you're playing God, and building worlds and doing the kind of extreme data visualization that people find not only beautiful and compelling, but fun in a ludic way, you really begin to understand which measurements are important to your research, which states and phase states are relevant, and how proper classification, that is the formation and use of classes, can either make things work or make things fall apart or buggy or hang. Burn states, quote, the value of this approach is that it permits an examination of the dynamics of the system because measuring the parameters at successive time points enables the production of an account of the trajectory of the system, that is, of the path that the system takes through the state space." End quote. Now, I see this as a fairly clear endorsement of the idea that animation and the mindset of an animator is supremely important for holistic science. Byrne continues, quote, The alternative term, phase space, indicates that what is interesting is the conditions under which the system radically changes its state and hence its position in the state space. It changes phase. It's important to note that such phase changes are non-linear. In other words, a small change in one or more of the parameters can produce a large change in the state of the system, end quote. I'm gratified personally that Byrne points out the non-linearity of these changes. As a non-linear video editor who is now creating a computer game, I've been trying for years to cajole students into the non-linear phase of their education journey. Our education system at its worst straightjacketed so many of you into linear habits of thinking and production that it's hard to create a culture of true scientific thinking. Remember that our education system was set up during the early transition from an agrarian to an industrial economy at a time when tailorization and a mechanistic Fordist assembly line view of manufacture prevailed. You were trained to be a cog in the wheel of the assembly line and everything about it was linear. <clears throat> parts weren't supposed to talk to other members of the whole unless they were adjacent parts of a linear and economically optimized workflow. <clears throat> 
There was supposed to be no extraneous interaction, certainly not between members of different classes. But nonlinear phase changes in complex work and space demand different conditions. Burns says, quote, this is essentially a product of interaction. Physical scientists call this a failure of superposition. In Newtonian systems, the linear systems of early factories, for example, that's my take on it, effects are additive, he says. The resultant of two forces is the sum of them acting separately. Bring in a third force, and the sum is now the sum of the three acting separately. Superposition holds, but in a nonlinear system, interaction means that things don't happen like this. Traditionally, interaction is defined by saying that the relationship between two variables is modified by the value of a third, but this approach reifies the variables. It, it makes the variables the things. The things are not the variables, but the systems, the cases, and what is happening is that aspects of the cases work together in the case, and as we shall see in relation to other cases, to change the state of the system slash case in radical ways, end quote. Hmm. Having read that, heavy stuff, having read that quote, I cannot emphasize enough the resonance this has with systems thinking in general. It would appear that the very nature of measurement itself has always brought up profound philosophical questions that inevitably lead to a systems thinking approach. Perhaps some of you have read the best-selling and prize-winning book Measuring the World by Daniel Kellerman or seen the film based on it about the lives, quote, of German mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss and German geographer Alexander von Humboldt, who was accompanied on his journeys by French explorer Aimé Bonplan and their many groundbreaking ways of taking the world's measure, as well as Humboldt's and Bonplan's travels in America and their meeting in 1828. That's a quote from Wikipedia. They were in two seemingly different disciplines, but faced the same issues concerning the nature of measurement. In fact, it is from Gauss that we get the famous bell curve, also eponymously known as a Gaussian distribution with all its uncertainties and gray areas. Wikipedia remarks about Gauss, quote, sometimes referred to as the princeps mathematicorum, Latin for the foremost of mathematicians, and the greatest mathematician since antiquity, Gauss had an exceptional influence in many fields of mathematics and science, and is ranked among history's most influential mathematicians who, quote, made significant contributions to many fields, including algebra, analysis, astronomy, differential geometry, electrostatics, geodesy, geophysics, magnetic fields, matrix theory, mechanics, number theory, optics, and statistics. Von Humboldt, meanwhile, was, quote, a Prussian polymath, a geographer, a naturalist, an explorer, an influential proponent of romantic philosophy and science, end quote. <laughs> you can do that too. They were both Renaissance men of tremendous influence, united by an obsession for measurement, for data collection. And the implication is that when you awaken and unleash your own sleeping but innate passion for measurement, you will also awaken the polymath within you, that sees things through a much wider and holistic lens that connects you to the whole universe even as you dive down to levels of fine detail only captured by the lens of a microscope. You will begin to see the connections between lots of systems simultaneously and that knowledge will give fresh insights even when you're focused on just a tiny singular part of the isolated system you may be studying. Measurement is the key to both reduction and expansion. It's the bridge. As Byrne writes, quote, there are two other aspects to the idea of state space which I want to consider before we turn to the process of classification. The first relates to considering the condition not of single systems, but of lots of systems, of, to borrow a useful term from the physical sciences, ensembles of systems. I'm going to propose, he says, a method of classification which is based on ensembles of systems that have similar trajectories. In other words, a dynamic approach to classification rather than a nominalist approach." End quote. This idea of dynamic approaches to how we classify variables is something I alluded to during our last lecture when we looked at Dr. Heather Rothrock's slides about writing a proposal where we looked at we looked a bit at the difference between 
quote, ordinal approaches and, quote, nominal approaches. I declared that one reason why I favor courses that follow no set sequence in their syllabus is that they are generally too rigid for the diversity of minds in a course and certainly in science. We use procedures with sequences, of course, for certain applications to achieve certain results. Cookbook approaches are necessary for many things. But when it comes to doing original science, as we expect you to do in your research, the cookbook fails because it can't classify objects and procedures in a flexible way. In some recipes, baking soda is a source of carbon dioxide to make baked goods rise without yeast. In others, it is sodium bicarbonate used to neutralize pH. So, so how do you classify it? As a leavening agent or an acidity buffer? Or both? It reminds me of the uh, Saturday Night Live uh, skit where they talk about new shimmer. Is it a floor wax or a dessert topping? Baking soda, sodium carbonate, nominally it can be labeled either or both. Ordinally, its use depends on context. We need a dynamic classification system to see that. Byrne continues, quote, the other thing we need to think about is what Reed and Harvey, 1992, describe after Prerogene as nested systems. It is very important to recognize that the idea of nested implies neither hierarchy nor impermeable boundaries. In other words, systems that contain other systems are as potentially liable to be influenced by those contained as the contained are to be influenced by the container. Moreover, system boundaries are not exact." End quote. Politically, of course, this is upsetting to power holders when even the most quantitative of sciences is telling us that hierarchy pyramids, and impermeable boundaries of class are not implied or, or even supported. A slave for 12 years can be a CEO or a president the next year. That's the social implication. And when you start playing with classes and com creating computer programs and games, you quickly learn why we moved away from static programming languages to what we call OOPS, object-oriented programming systems, where, make no mistake, to make computers function best, there are also no rigid hierarchies or permeable, impermeable boundaries. The matrix be damned. Byrne points out how fictional, how, how unrealistic and productivity hindering boundaries are, something that will upset many wall-supporting Trumpsters. Quote, Silliers, 1998, goes so far as to say they are essentially momentary products of measurement examination. I would go further, but would still see the reality of boundaries as essentially temporal and contextual. Combining the idea of nested systems with the, and ensembles of systems gives us a method of examining historical change, another way of expressing the idea of dynamism, both for social orders as a whole and for elements within those social orders, including both individuals and households and the social collectivities typified by class." End quote. <clears throat> he goes on to say, quote, "...temporal and contextual nested systems and ensembles of systems is what the nature of measurement reveals. And I say, as your professor, the act of measuring doesn't tie data down through its quest for precision and accuracy. It opens a Pandora's box of questions. Measurement, you see, is heuristic. It leads to questions that lead to further questions that lead to still further questions and so on down the rabbit hole. One measurement implies an endless series of more measurements. The job of truth-seeking through the collection of valid data is never done. So when you pick a project to start investigating, like when you're working on your ACE project proposal, when you have formed your hypotheses and started to go out there and take measurements, be aware that the very nature of measurement is one of mind-blowing philosophical enrichment. You may think you're simply taking something's temperature or measuring how much something has grown. What you're really doing is taking your first step on the journey of a thousand miles, setting sail on a history and globe-spanning adventure, just like Alexander von Humboldt. Remember William Blake, the poet, saying, I can see the world in a grain of sand? Or Walt Whitman saying, I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. That is the nature 
of measurement.